Hello and welcome to this lecture on software product lines. In today's lecture, we want to see how to implement features in a modular fashion, uh, where we have interfaces among the features between the features. And we looked at compile time variability already in the last lectures in terms of conditional compilation that we can do with build systems and preprocessors. But we've seen that we have many problems with those techniques that come from the fact that features are not modular. So in this lecture, the goal is to show you how to implement features in a modular way. This lecture has been created by Timo Kehrer from the University of Bern and Elias Küter from University of Magdeburg and I uh, supported him in creating these slides. So in our lecture, we talked about uh, different topics. We talked about ad hoc approaches to variability already. We talked about feature modeling, how to model features. The last lecture was about conditional compilation. Uh, so we were able to implement features in a compile time fashion. And we still want to implement features in a compile time fashion in this lecture, but we want to have some modularity principles among them. So this lecture is again divided into three parts. In the first part, we will talk about components. So component is a, a very common concept in software engineering for many years, uh, but we will see how components can be used for product line implementation. Then we will look at services and also the hype topic microservices. And in the last part, we will talk about black box frameworks, which can be implemented in terms of plugins. So let's uh, dive in and we will first talk about components. Um, before we go into uh, details, uh, let me remind you of the general story that we have. So we have defined a feature model or some kind of other model where it's clear what are the features that we want to implement, what are the combinations that we want to make available to customers, to uh, users of our software. And um, basically, we can derive valid configurations. And given the valid configurations, what we want to do, what is our goal, is to automatically generate products or at least derive products from this point of view. And this is the lecture uh, number six. And we already uh, discussed uh, some solutions uh, regarding that vision in the last lecture. And there will also be some further techniques in the next lecture. So what is missing with existing techniques? Um, so uh, let me remind you of build systems, how we can use uh, build systems to implement features. Um, we can use build systems for conditional compilation. We can exploit the expressiveness of a build systems configuration language. Uh, most um, uh, uh, build, scripting, uh, lang uh, build script languages are Turing complete, so we can make any computations. And those computations then can result in uh, yeah, particular behavior that is dependent on the feature selection, the selected features in our configuration. And in terms of build systems, what, is, what can be easily done is to include certain files or exclude certain files depending on the feature selection, as we've discussed in last lecture, or even entire directories. So what are open challenges? And this is a recap from lecture five. Um, these build scripts may become very complex. We looked at uh, some uh, excerpts of the Linux kernel uh, build scripts. Uh, there's no limit to what can be done. And there's also um, a different story uh, on this. I mean, it's, it's hard to understand for programmers and humans at some point in time if it becomes very complex. But it's also hard to analyze for tools, which is also uh, something that we will look into in a later lecture. So, and basically, it's it's very uh, fun, a, a very uh, a generic technique because we can only include and exclude files or directories and not chunks of code, at least not easily. So, as it is Turing complete, uh, anything is possible, but um, not with build systems on its own. Then we've looked into more fine granular variability in terms of preprocessors. We looked at this example with, uh, uh, of a graph implementation that has weights or directed edges or undirected edges. And 
Preprocessors can also be used to implement conditional compilation, but on a fine granular level, and we can annotate and potentially remove certain parts of the software. And again, there's a recap on what are the major challenges that we face there. Uh, we've seen that the scattering and tangling, uh, which hampers um, understanding of the programs, but also is a common source of problems and errors. Uh, we are actually mixing multiple languages, so we have a language to implement our software artifacts and the additional language that cross-cuts um, uh, and both are not really interacting very, very well. So we have code obfuscation, it's hard to analyze for tools, uh, but also for humans. Uh, I regularly have uh, some uh, example code with preprocessor statements in my undergraduate course and uh, it's very complicated, uh, even if you have just like uh, four features, uh, all the com possible combinations are hard to imagine. So there are many errors that can be introduced by means of preprocessors, and we want to avoid them by means of modularity principles. And let me recap, what is modularity? So we will not give you a, a long lecture about modularity, but here we will uh, uh, look at a very um, a brief and uh, very simple uh, discussion of the term modularity. Modularity is the consistent application of information hiding and data and concept, uh, encapsulation. So this means we want to have a strong logical connection between the inner parts of a module. So there is there are some module boundaries. So we have some concept of a module, and within it's fine to have. Um, a strong connection uh, between those parts, uh, which is uh, uh, called cohesion. But uh, on the outside, so when it comes to modules and communication between modules, we want to have minimal interfaces. We want to have them uh, as uh, simple as possible. And this results in low coupling. So we have some pictures on this. Um, so let me uh, define the terms uh, cohesion and coupling. And um, uh, we still have a, a small problem here in the code. So this is supposed to be a right arrow. So people that are aware of LaTeX might, uh, might be able to pass this on their own. Um, so cohesion is how well the parts of a module work together. And this is about the communication within a module. So what you can see here in the, uh, the example is that we have a very good communication uh, and lots of the communication is actually happening within the module, uh, module uh, boundaries. And there's only few um, um, connections uh, across, uh, across different uh, boundaries. And this is what we call coupling. So coupling is a measure of how complex is the communication across modules. And then we can uh, think of like different situations where we have uh, high coupling and low cohesion or low coupling and high cohesion. And this is uh, basically a matter of fact also, what is a module, uh, module boundary? So in this example, it could mean the module boundary could be a class. So if we look at uh, the top level picture, this could mean that we have a class here. And these are members, like methods, for instance. And this is a very common situation that we have in source code, is that uh, classes uh, have a very high coupling among each other. So it's typically not very easy to just remove a certain class from a larger system and replace it by another one. So this is, um, uh, this is a common picture that we, that we will see, but still we want to achieve a high um, a cohesion if possible. And the picture below here is rather uh, on a different scale. So this is a very common uh, picture of, uh, illustration if we look at a larger scale, so like a package. And these are, for instance, classes. And we look at which classes interact with each other. But in any case, um, 
this uh, picture uh, is, is supposed to illustrate that there's kind of, um, uh, yeah, uh, the overall goal is always to have high cohesion and low coupling, but uh, we will see that it's only possible to a certain degree to achieve this uh, high cohesion. So why modularity? There are traditional reasons for modularity. Modules can be developed independently of each other, at least to some extent, uh, extent and it depends on their cohesion. Uh, they're easier to maintain because changes can be made locally, uh, especially if we have high cohesion. Uh, we have data encapsulation, uh, which promotes stability and reliability. So there's, uh, uh, it's more stable uh, if we can uh, encapsulate certain uh, properties, certain details uh, within a module, uh, then we can more freely change it uh, and the outside will not so uh, much be affected on this. Um, the software is probably easier to understand if we divide it into certain modules. Uh, so this is a very common principle uh, for uh, many decades now. Uh, basically from the beginning of software engineering and uh, we want to hide complexity behind interfaces so software will be uh, less complex if we look at certain parts and the decomposition is basically a divide and conquer strategy when we look at modern software it's so complex that a single human cannot understand the whole system but modularization decomposition helps us to be able to work with the system to understand uh, at least certain parts and still be able to make changes to it. When we look at modularity and product lines, um, there are some additional reasons. Uh, we can apply all the traditional reasons also to software product lines, but there's some uh, additional ones. We want to have reuse. We want to have certain parts of the software that can be reused among different products of the software. We might want to have something like alternatives. So we have alternative implementation for the same thing. Uh, or we have variability so that modules can be reassembled in a new context. The module can be taken outside of one project and used in another project. So let's do a quick recap of components. I guess uh, most of you have already heard of components before in some undergraduate courses uh, as it is one of the most central uh, things in software engineering. So a software component is a unit of composition uh, with contractually specified interfaces and explicit context dependencies only. A software component can be deployed independently as subject to composition by third parties. So the idea is we develop components and then they can be used and reused in different contexts. We can also um, compose uh, components that are actually developed by different third parties. So there are component diagrams where a component, a single component looks like something like this, uh, uh, with we have uh, required interface, provided interface, required interface says, what does the component need from other components, provided interface, what does it provide, what is its API towards other components. And there are different uh, context and deployment dependencies uh, that are able to um, yeah, uh, handle the communication across different modules. Uh, so you don't need to create your own module system. So some languages uh, provide this as there was no module system in Java for quite some time. We even see different ones here like Java Enterprise Edition or OSGI. So different alternatives have been implemented over the time. So now when we talk about components, it comes to composition and reuse. Uh, so we compose components with other components to form software systems. So a single component is typically not a software system, but a software system is composed out of different ones. Uh, components are supposed to be reusable in other systems. Uh, so this is the, the basic idea of components that we not only develop it once, but can reuse it. And it may even, uh, a component may stem from third party vendors, uh, which uh, brings us to two different things. One is that there's kind of the vision of a market for components. So everyone uh, develops components and puts them onto the market. And 
This brings us on the other hand to make or buy decisions where you uh, always uh, face a decision. Do we want to implement this component on our own or do we want to buy an existing component and integrate it in our system? And here we have a small uh, email client system, uh, a very simplified one where we have an email client and uh, it communicates with a browser. So an email client typically has the ability to uh, display HTML because uh, emails can be uh, formatted with HTML. So we need some kind of browser component and we can reuse something from a browser here, uh, but it may also have some internal uh, components like an email viewer, a calendar viewer, contacts and so on. So what is the difference between components and objects and classes? In a previous lecture, we already talked about design patterns, how um, we can uh, construct our system, design our system in a way that we achieve modularity. But when we talked about modularity over there, we were interested in modularity in terms of classes, how we can be um, implement variable parts. So there are some commonalities of objects and classes and components. We have a couple of similar principles. Encapsulation, information hiding is something that we want to have from both. Uh, we want to have accessibility through public interfaces. So we have some uh, certain interface and certain parts of the uh, software can be accessed either uh, whether it's a class, uh, we have some public methods, or if it's a component, we have some public classes which uh, uh, provide its or sum up to its overall API. And then we have decomposition, composition, we have nested objects and components. We've just seen an example on the previous slide. But there are differences. So objects are typically smaller than components, focus on more detailed implementation problems. Uh, components aim to abstract from uh, more, uh, aim to provide more abstraction from implementation details. Whereas objects uh, interact with each other, they have a larger interface. We talked about uh, cohesion and coupling. So there's typically a larger coupling um, among those objects. So objects are uh, less cohesive and stronger coupled uh, than components. And this is on purpose. So because components, we want to take a component and reuse it in another context. So if there's a lot of coupling to other components, we will not be able to do this. Whereas the goal for classes is actually, in most cases, not that we can take a single class and reuse it in another context. So it's fine that classes have more coupling among each other. We have reuse uh, of classes by means of inheritance, by means of polymorphism, uh, whereas components are integrated in some kind of component architecture and we have communication among them. So, but let's come to uh, the uh, actual part of the uh, lecture. We would talk about product lines, about software product lines, so how to implement them with components. We can imagine that we have a reusable component in Java. And for now, we assume something very weird. We assume that the handling of colors is non-trivial. So there's a lot to do. And in our graph library, we don't want to implement this in our graph library on its own, but we want to delegate this to a special component handling all the color parts. So we want to implement color management as a reusable component, and we want to use Java's visibility mechanisms uh, to create an API. So what we can see from this example is that there's quite some classes that are hidden from the outside. So they are used for implementation, but there's a public API with public, uh, public class, uh, public methods, uh, uh, fields, public methods. Um, and there's, there might be some, uh, some extra uh, functionality to uh, only have one instance uh, of the color component because one instance might be sufficient for our setup. So how can this color uh, component be used in our graph implementation? So I won't go into all the details because this is a running example that we've used in previous lectures already. But we have graphs and those graphs can have nodes that are either colored or not colored. And if we have the feature colored enabled, and this is kind of similar to what we've seen previously with runtime, 
variability, uh, then we will uh, have some additional code executed, which uh, assigns uh, the node uh, to, uh, or asks, uh, delegates some of the uh, functionality to the color component. But we see that there's still a number of places where we need to make extensions. Uh, so we do have some extra code when we, whenever we add new nodes, we need to uh, assign them a color. We have some additional parameter here. We have some um, additional uh, code to map colors and we have some additional code. Whenever we print out something, uh, we need to do something. And this is a very common situation when it comes to reuse of components that in order to be able to reuse a component, we need to provide some additional implementation to connect our implementation, our existing product to that very component and to apply and reuse that functionality of that component. And this is known as glue code. So glue code is a way to express that we cannot just combine some components and then we are done, but we need some glue to connect those components. Right? If you think of, we've had uh, Lego uh, in some of our previous examples and slides, and Lego, you simply plug together those parts, uh, but this will not work for uh, software components because uh, we still need to say how they are connected and how those APIs are actually used. So how to implement now product lines with these uh, components? The general idea is every feature is implemented by a dedicated component. We will see in a minute that we might need to relax this um, uh, uh, assumption a bit. Uh, and the feature selection determines which components shall be integrated to form an application, meaning that we select all those components, we put them together, but we still need to write our application, the glue code that combines all the different components. So the, the vision, while well, the vision is we simply take the components and create something, in practice this is uh, a lot different because what we need to provide in addition is what is called glue code. Okay, this looks a bit weird over here. So developers must connect these components by means of glue code. There is um, an exception. So it, in some cases, it might be possible to replace one component by another one if they have the very same API and there's no other thing that uh, differs from the outside perspective. But this is a very uncommon case, right? If you think of that there's a component by one vendor and a component by another vendor, it's very likely that they will have different APIs and it's impossible to just uh, mix and match and just replace an alternative component. And then the question is how to implement this glue code and um, the naive way would be to basically do something uh, what we've already discussed as clone and own. So you build your own application every time uh, you clone it, you remove some components, add some components. And another way to do this is um, yeah, to uh, use runtime variability or some other technique for the um, actual glue code. In addition, this, the general idea of implementing every feature in a dedicated component may not work out very well because a component, as I said, is larger than a single class and it, we need at least a certain uh, size for a component to be worth it. And then it's a question and we have features that are kind of cross cutting at different positions. We've seen this for the color code. There will still be some color, some code about colors in the main application, even though we have a color component. And the question is how to express this. So we might even have um, some mixture of different techniques here. So what is common for components is that a component internally has some variability. So it could be that we have a component to handle nodes and this component has some runtime variability to handle colors in addition. So this brings us to the library scaling problem. And uh, what uh, this is about is that we have some 
Yeah, basically the size of a component, the best size of a component cannot be easily um, uh, yeah, derived. So when we have large components, then they are typically not widely usable. So every single uh, line, every single method that we add to an API is basically contains some design decisions that provide some more uh, functionality, but also make some more decisions on the design, which might be conflicting in some situations. So in the most simple case, it could be that we have a component which is one gigabyte of storage or requires one gigabyte of storage in terms of uh, compiled program code. Uh, and we might have some uh, embedded devices where it's not feasible to apply this anymore because it's simply too large. Uh, so, but it's not only about the size uh, of the uh, components, but also that we have many design decisions in there. And the more design decisions we make, the more conflicting it can be to other requirements that come from our application. So this is called vertical scaling. We also have the alternative, the other extreme small components, which is called horizontal scaling. Uh, so if we have very small components, then the the payoff uh, will be very limited because we have a lot of integration effort uh, for uh, integrating all those small components into our program. So in the most extreme case, you could say, my program is just one large component, but then it, you will be very limited in uh, adding this in, in other products. And on the other hand, you could say every single statement, every single method or class is a component, but then you will have a very high integration effort. And this can be visualized by means of this picture. So uh, it's a little bit uh, strange, but the example um, uh, is uh, from a book uh, by Czarnecki and Eisenecker. And um, in the book, uh, they made the uh, analogy of tangrams. So tangram is basically a picture where you can build different uh, forms out of pieces. And the question is how to um, cut this uh, left picture su such that we can provide also all the other different uh, options on the right hand side. So the question is how to cut uh, over here. So we could decide to make a cut here, make a cut here, uh, make a cut here or something like this. But then uh, you, you might already recognize that uh, this is not sufficient to build all these other products. And this is kind of what is known as the library scaling problem. So it's not only about the size of components, but also how to decompose our large system into smaller parts such that, that these smaller parts can be reused in other parts. So there's typically a practical compromise. Uh, we have mostly vertically scaled uh, components. So we top, uh, often have large components um, and uh, those can be used only in certain situations. In other words, so there's no general market for arbitrary components, uh, but only uh, components are typically provided to a very specialized market segment. So I want to wrap up this part uh, by means of the discussion of components. We do this for every of our implementation techniques. We have the advantage that components support compile time variability by design, right? So the idea is I either have a component or I don't have the component. So there's some inherent compile time variability available. We have a modular implementation, and it's very likely that compared to preprocessors or runtime variability on its own as techniques, we have reduced scattering or tangling because whenever we try to uh, organize something in a certain module, then uh, uh, we might be able to um, uh, modularize it uh, also along the features. There are a couple of challenges, uh, and this list is actually longer over here. Uh, so components are probably not uh, the end of the story for product lines. Um, it requires glue code for every product. And the question is how to implement that glue code. We can either um, uh, see, we see in the practice that often clone and own is then used for the glue code, or we can implement the glue code with runtime variability. So then we will have a mixture of runtime and compile time variability. Uh, we don't have an automated generation based on 
feature selection uh, this depends a bit on how we implement the glue code but the most general case is that we do some clone and own and then it's not automated it requires pre-planning and this is uh, kind of the the uh, the result of the library scaling problem um, the question what is a good size of the component how to decompose the system requires some uh, pre-planning of where do I want to reuse those parts uh, later on? And this is, of course, related to feature modeling. And feature modeling, we look at what are the features out there, and we see what are the different combinations we want to support. And then this uh, helps us to understand and can help to, with this pre-planning. But in any case, this pre-planning is needed. And it's not that much needed for preprocessors or build systems that we've talked about before. Another disadvantage is that we have basically no support for fine granular variability, so, and that's why components are often combined with other implementation techniques, for instance, one-time variability within components. So what are the lessons learned of this part? We talked about modularity, which is basically, in a very simplified fashion, information hiding in data encapsulation. Uh, components foster a modular architecture and design of software in general. And we looked at the perspective, what can we do with components in terms of product lines? We can reuse components within and beyond product lines, uh, and but still there's no automated production, uh, automated product derivation uh, from a feature selection because we need to provide some glue code that connects those different components. Here's some further reading over here, and we have a practical task for you in case you want to reflect our topics a bit how is why is feature modeling relevant for component based product lines how can product line engineering help to find right trade offs regarding the library scaling problem i hope you enjoyed the lecture uh, we do have some uh, questions then at the end of the next part and the next video will be on services and microsystems see you later